Hello, this is Jitte Wagen and this is the second video in a series of videos in which I will be introducing RGS 10.7.1. Now in this second screencast I will be addressing uh, three main things. The first thing is I will show how we can uh, georeference a, a map without any uh, coordinate reference system, without any coordinates, so just a flat image uh, containing some uh, spatial or topographical information, how we can georeference that using ArcGIS. The second thing is I will be showing how you can go to online data portals and get data from online data portals into your GIS environment, as well as um, a tool to do that from within ArcGIS. And the third thing uh, is that I will be showing how you can digitize some data using ArcGIS. Okay, so to start with the georeferencing, and let me get out of this layout view uh, where we ended in the in the last video um, to uh, to get back into our working environment. Um, so let's recapitulate what we have here. We have the AHN3, which is an elevation data on our research area. We have here um, a shape file containing um, the uh, fe archaeological feature interpretation. We have here a shape file containing Actually, the, uh, the the for hardening, which means the um, street levels and um, uh, highways, etc. So everything that is built out of um, uh, concrete and stone in the area, um, but not the buildings themselves, only the the levels on which you can walk or drive. Um, then we have a, a layer in which we selected the first layer of all archaeological trenches and visualize it and then we have here the finds. Now what we are going to do is we are going to get a raster file which is a, a picture with topographical information and we are going to georeference that using um, the information that we have in our map here so using the, the, the information on the uh, roads and streets etc uh, and, and possibly the elevation data uh, to, uh, to georeference that uh, to place it on its right location in the map. Okay, so the file that we want to georeference is here in our data set. Uh, and uh, this is the file to georefereren met verharding. So to georeference with the information in the shape file with the verharding, so the streets and the, uh, the roads. Um, I can double click on it. We will see then that uh, it is it has three bands. And if we look at it in the uh, through the Windows Explorer, um, Let's take a look. We can see that this is indeed a, a raster file. It's a JPEG and it contains uh, uh, topographical information in colors. And this is indeed what I have been talking about in the first video. A so-called multi-band raster in which we have RGB values stored in these uh, different bands. Now I will add it to our map in this way. And then we'll get a... Uh, a message um, that uh, was to be expected. The following data sources are added. Uh, you are you added are missing spatial reference information. The data can be drawn in ArcMap but not projected. Of course, because um, there is nothing uh, of a projection coordinate reference system defined for this file whatsoever. So if we add it now, uh, contrary to our trend, uh, uh, archaeological trial trenches that. Um, appeared on their right locations because they had coordinates which made sense in this coordinate reference system our map is uh, is not visible so if we right click on the map and we zoom to layer we can see that it has been inserted but if we uh, look uh, where it is inserted we can see that in the uh, left upper corner um, if i would be able to point as exact as possible, but look look to the coordinates here in the lower right end of the uh, the screen or for the interface. You can see that the left upper corner has been inserted on coordinate zero zero. The, so obviously, um, this is not uh, uh, anywhere near our research area. And it is because there is no there are not even coordinates uh, related uh, attached to this file. So if we would zoom to full extent, you can see that we have now here the uh, research area with all data which is very small and then probably somewhere down here in the left uh, lower corner of the screen we would have 
our uh, topographical uh, map, but we're not even seeing it because the distance is so big and um, the file uh, itself, the, the geographical uh, extent is so small. So in order, the georeferencing is actually the process of placing that topographical map on the right coordinates in the coordinate reference system we are working with. So let's go to the map. Okay, so in order to georeference this raster file, uh, we have to switch on a toolbar. So if we right click on any vacant area in the uh, program interface, we get a list of toolbars that we can turn on and off. And if we look at the G, we can see here the toolbar georeferencing. So we click on that. And actually, I want to make these toolbars part of the interface. I think that's uh, better than that they cover the uh, map canvas uh, by floating over it. And now here we have our georeferencing toolbar in the, uh, in the interface of ArcGIS. Okay, so um, the important thing here is that we set the, the um, the raster file that we want to uh, georeference properly, otherwise we will be um, creating a mess of things. So here in this selection screen, we have to make sure that the right raster is selected, which it is. Um, here with the georeferencing um, options, uh, we have a few uh, tools which are useful. We have auto adjust, which means that it will try to process um, the uh, the information that we're going to give when for, uh, the reference information we're going to give uh, as directly as possible which is useful because you can immediately see whether you have good or bad results um, we can here uh, set transformation types which are is going to be important once we have some reference points and then we have some uh, some basic options now first of all uh, I want to uh, show how to use this fit to display um, option because it's very useful. As I showed these to uh, this, this raster is very very far because it's at this uh, uh, coordinate reference system source point of zero uh, um, comma zero. So what I want to do is I want to go to our research area, and as you can see here, um, we see that um, the there is a general correspondence. Of course, we see that we the information on the raster more or less covers this area. Now, if we are sure of that, we can use the fit to display to make sure the um, the image is just, um, let's say, brute force transported to this area. So now we have the image at least more or less on the right location, so it will be easier to make the comparisons and actually place the feature uh, correctly on its uh, on its right location in this uh, coordinate reference system. Okay, then about the basic process. So what are we going to do when I say we add uh, the reference information? We are simply uh, going to point and click using the Add Control Points tool. So the Add Control Points tool is a tool with which you say, I want this source point on my image that I want to georeference um, this source point corresponds with this point in my uh, coordinate reference system, such as I'm using it in uh, in ArcGIS. And if you feed the the program, the georeferencing tool, enough reference points, it is able to reproject the information in the raster file, so it actually uh, is is properly referenced to our data. Just remember that the, this uh, fit to display action that I just performed is a an on-the-fly um, uh, graphical projection now in, in ArcGIS and hasn't changed the file in any bit. So if I would now remove it and edit again, it would still um, be visualized at 0, 0.0. So we're now going to start the process of adding these control points. Um, and in order to do that, um, it is important to uh, make sure we can easily switch between these uh, two um, file so that we can either do that by um, turning it off and on and looking for reference points and another way to do it is to go to the properties of this file go to the display tab and set its transparency for example to 50 percent so we uh, are able to to look at both the information on the uh, topography raster as well as the information that we already have in our um, in our art map 
a document. Um, let's switch off the HN because that kind of uh, confuses confuses the information. I'll switch off everything except from the uh, the shape file with the uh, for Harding. So the streets and the roads. And now, if you if you look properly, you can already see um, matching elements. So we have here on the top topographical raster we have here the main road with these two roundabouts and we see that we also have them in our referenced data and then there is some uh, some other information um, that that is visible as well so we can use that for example here corners of buildings so we can use these these uh, corresponding points to actually um, start adding control points okay so let's do that and I will uh, start here, zoom in to uh, start adding these points. So you can see here that we have these uh, these little buildings over here, which correspond to these two uh, uh, empty areas in the shape file. And then I have this corner here, and that obviously corresponds to, to this corner over here. So if I want to add a control point uh, in order to be able to georeference, I will click on the tool. I will click on the source location on our raster. And uh, I have to say that um, clearly um, the result will will uh, be uh, dependent on many things, and of course the result will be dependent on the uh, the information at hand and the precision and the resolution of your data. In any case, and you can already see that uh, the, the the cells of this raster are, do actually quite a bad job of describing the shape of this building. So there, there will be a degree of error when I click on this corner, but this is not a very precise uh, identification of this corner. So um, we can already say that this is going to be a general uh, reference and we can use the, the resulting um, georeference map for illustration and maybe rough comparisons, but we shouldn't uh, try to uh, use it for exact coordinates or, or measurements. In any case, having said that, let's start adding the first control point. So I will say this is my source point, and then I will uh, I will select this uh, the corner of the building in my shape file. Okay, now we because we set auto adjust, it already um, processed this uh, move, so it already shifted a little bit the location of my. Uh, georeference uh, my raster file that I'm georeferencing to its right location but clearly uh, apart from the location the scale of the information on my raster is is different because the the distance between the building on my uh, uh, topographical raster and the uh, the edge here of this street at the roundabout is much shorter than the distance between the, the same two points in my shape file. So there's a scale issue here as well. And these are exactly the types of things that you are correcting when doing the georeferencing um, process. So I can go about this by um, selecting another point and making sure that I connect it to its corresponding point. And I will do that by selecting this corner over here and connecting it to that corner. So I'll select another source location, click on this one, and there we are. So we can see that we are now uh, progressing. So actually with these two control points, one and two, we already have a, a good match between um, our two files. Um, you can see that the information now here with the, on this roundabout where we added no control points at all is is kind of matching roughly to uh, to the information um, on the topographical uh, map so it, it's not too bad um, and um, we can we can go on um, with this um, let's do just add a third point to uh, to um, have a bit of data to work with so you see here that uh, for example we, we we have this here the uh, let's switch off a bit the um, the shape file so we can see it a bit better we have here these uh, empty areas um, probably containing some grass or, or plants next to the roundabout uh, i want this corner and i want to select it create a source point turn on the shape file and then that should be that point so i now want to connect it to that point so i click and then it shifts again now actually you see that this is um 
actually may be worse than it was because the circle here that, that was corresponding more or less with the center of the roundabout is now more off than it was. So this is probably not a very good reference point. Now we can do this visually um, controlling uh, the error points, looking at the degree to which they cause uh, a, a better or worse correspondence between the two files. But there's also another way to do it. So if I click on this um, icon over here, I can look at the link table. Okay, so what can we do with this link table? We see here three points, indeed, we added three links. We have an X, a Y of the source. Uh, so this is referring to the coordinates of the raster image uh, as it was inserted on the zero, zero uh, coordinate in the left upper corner. Then we have um, the, the destination X and Y. So these are the coordinates that we uh, generated by clicking on our, uh, our research area locations. And then we see here a number of residuals. Now the res these residuals are the result of a uh, mismatch between the, the totality of control points. So you can imagine that if you have a control point that, that makes a shift uh, upwards, but not um, to the left or right, and then you have another control point that actually makes a, a, a smaller shift upwards, but has some uh, movement to the right of the uh, original control point, um, then you have a, a information that that is going to create a tension and of course this is only um happening after adding the third control point because then there may be indeed be contradicting information being fed into the georeferencing process uh through the uh through, through um adding new points so um this this uh mismatch between these points can be actual uh, useful information because it may be that the that the raster you're going to georeference has been drawn in a totally different projection system may even be contain errors it, it may be skewed for some reason or if you scanned a an analog a paper map then you will have distortions at the edges very likely um, it can be even a an intended bird's eye or, or view or something with a bit of perspective. So there may be many reasons why you would be, um, let's say, violating the uh, Cartesian um, uh, structure of your raster um, uh, with topographical information. Um, and it may be information that's useful because you would then need a different transformation to actually get the the data in a right way onto your uh, onto your um, your map canvas. Now, this refers actually these different types of ways to which you can distort your original image to fit with your uh, the coordinate reference system in your uh, map canvas, and these are called uh, transformations. Now, for example, we have here a couple of um, <coughs> transformations. Um, and we can do a, for example, a zero order polynomial uh, transformation, which basically only shifts. So if we select that, this means that the, um, the uh, properties of the raster image are completely respected. It does not um, skew the, the topographical image. It does not um, make a trapezoidal um, distortion of it. It does not allow for for scaling or rotating the only thing it does is it shifts so it places the image with exactly the same um, dimensions onto the location uh, that it can find out through your uh, control points now what happens if we select just the shift um, uh, uh, transformation and yeah i think it's it is difficult to literally see this um, in our map, but um, we'll see some difference with the other types of transformations. Um, but, but the important thing that we see happening here is that we will now have residuals. And these residuals are indeed expressing the mismatch between the points you, uh, uh, you, you clicked on on the topographical raster and the points that you uh, told uh, RGS that they should be in 
your coordinate reference system in um, in your map canvas. So these residuals are actually saying, well, this point is actually very far off where it should be because I have to respect the uh, the, the original um, form of the uh, the topographical raster. Uh, I cannot uh, translate, rotate, or, or whatever. So this is the best I can do. And then the mismatch between the the in this link where you pointed on the original file and where it should be in the uh, in the map canvas uh, has a, uh, a a value attached to it. So it's this big. Now, um, in case uh, this we we would know that a shift transformation would be the, the way to go about it and it would be actually get us the right result as long as we would establish the correct links then what we would be doing is we should look at these links see which one of them has the largest residual error um uh, which is a least squares error by the way um and we would um we should uh, try and identify uh the, where the problems are then delete those points and we can delete those points using this um, function over here delete control point and then we can just re-establish another one uh, and, and go on uh, with that until we have a satisfactory uh, 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 georeference for our data now there are other types of transformations as i said so we can have a um a uh, first order polynomial and a fine now you you may have noticed that the uh, shape of the uh, um, the topographical raster changed a bit. We also now have zero residuals and a um, the uh, first order polynomial fine allows for uh, in addition to the shift it allows for rotation, it allows for scaling, and it also allows for skewing the data. So um, it, with these four let's say variables to um, to manipulate the transformation algorithm actually can get all these control points exactly uh, in the map canvas um, uh, as, as we want them to be and then the residuals uh, go down to zero now other options here are um, similarity polynomial which is actually between uh, just shifting and affine and uh, the similarity polynomial means you can uh, shift, you can uh, rotate, and you can scale, but you cannot skew. So then, as, again, the aspect ratio of all the um, elements in your topographical raster uh, will be respected. And if I do that, you can see that I have residuals, but because we allow for uh, rotation and scaling, these residuals are uh, much smaller than, uh, than with the... Uh, the first uh, transformation option, uh, option zero polynomial. Now to finish uh, the um, the set, uh, there are some more options here. We have second and third degree uh, or order polynomial uh, transformations that just increasingly allow for more complex type of distortions. Then we have uh, spline on the other hand. So where the, uh, the, the polynomial options actually uh, try to uh, respect as much as possible the global um, order of your data so it, they try to respect the the, the 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 all the distortions that they allow are global in the sense that they affect the complete image um, and the other option uh, or let's say the other approach to this would be to use spline uh, which is also known in other contexts as a rubber sheeting in which you actually try to get the local distortion as, as little as possible. So you allow for distortion at a very local level, um, but then the global information in the, uh, is not uh, respected anymore. So you won't have any um, global structure to, in the way the, to which the, uh, in, to the degree to which your, uh, your data is, this, your original raster is distorted. And then uh, the final one I will say something about is adjust. And adjust is then um, kind of best of both worlds. So adjust tries to combine a polynomial uh, um, transformation with a spline technique in order to see if that, uh, well, both respects global and local um, precision of the georeferencing as best as possible. Well, for, for our... Um, 
approach the similarity polynomial actually should be um, enough because we have data for which we know um, or at least I do that they are both recorded in the RD new system in which we are uh, working so I, I don't suspect there would be any uh, skew to our data so I will leave it to similarity polynomial and try to optimize for that uh, transformation okay and then the the process of doing so is to uh, is to keep on adding control points removing control points that are actually um, making things worse or have larger residual errors and then you we can go on and um, until we are satisfied with the result now in order to uh, demonstrate the principle i will uh, leave it at this and just accept these uh, residual errors to be uh, not um, too influential i just want this as a general reference to see where uh, my archaeological tri trial trenches may be overlapping uh, with the current topography because the excavation has been um, executed before the uh, infrastructure as you see it here uh, uh, was built so in that way i can uh, i can very generally compare the information on the two files so i will leave it at this in the sense that i will not um i will not uh, add any more control points um, and then uh, what we basically want to do is uh, two things. We can either update georeferencing or rectify. And before I do that, I just want to show one more thing, and that is we can actually use this menu, this the, the link table, to save uh, the links into a text file. So first of all, this can be useful because you could... Uh, uh, see this as some kind of meta info so this is information about your information and someone else might be interesting interested in how you got from a to b so how you manipulated your source data so if there are any uh, very problematic uh, errors or something uh, it would be possible to see if they originated in the um, in, in this process um, and second um, if you are unsure about your uh, geographic transformation you can save the points you can send them to someone else you can say well listen if you uh, open this file use them as transformation on this topographical raster can you look at the results and tell me what you think so it can be useful to uh, to save these uh, these points i'm not interested at this moment so i will uh, leave it at this and then the difference between these two um update and, and the rectify options uh, which is um, basically if i do an update georeferencing then i will uh, have my uh, jpeg file uh, as it was but i will have an additional file describing uh, this information so um, it will uh, let's say bake into that file um, these links uh, that, that describe the scale, the rotation, and the shift that I just did. And then the next file, as long as you keep those two files together, um, you can uh, always open this, uh, this uh, topographical raster and have it displayed correctly. What I will do, however, is I want to rectify. So I want to um, save the, uh, the current warp, as they call it, to a new data set. And now the... Um, the topographical raster is actually transformed into or i should say converted into a new uh raster file so if i choose rectify i can then set the cell size so i can then say well i want a different cell size um, i will have uh, i can say how i want no data to be displayed this is interesting because um together with the resample type uh these these are relevant options because you may imagine that if you um convert a raster in this way um you may have a for example a small rotation but because um the uh raster files are by definition um rectangles uh because they are uh, created by uh, square cells all of the same size and same orientation so if we rotate this we will have a new raster that will um, cover the extents of the rotated file and that will 
create some empty space. So if I would have a rotation um, anti-clockwise, I will have some empty area over here because this will have a, uh, a slightly diagonal orientation um, in, uh, in relation to the, the current version. And that means that the information on the topographical raster um, will has to be uh, will have to be reprojected onto uh, that new raster. So what happens is a new raster is created, and the information from this raster is projected on top of that uh, raster. Now, what happens then is that uh, you uh, need to set a resample a resample type because uh, there will be no uh, perfect match between the cells of both rasters, and then there is a uh, clear distinction uh, between discrete data and continuous data and with the nearest neighbor um, sharp edges will be uh, respected as much as possible whereas with the bilinear interpolation and cubic convolution um, what more matters is the is, is an, uh, an average of the uh, of the uh, cells um, on a local level uh, so the, uh, the the edges are not respected but the overall uh, values are are more respected and then, of course, we will then have no data zones in these areas in which for which we have no data. So you can set that as well. Um, and yeah, and then we have, of course, a name and a, uh, a, a compression type. Now, I will uh, select the location where I want my adjusted uh, file. So this is uh, going to be this workspace. Um, yes, and I uh, will give it a name. So I will say... Uh, Geo-referenced topography, and I'm fine with the uh, TIFF uh, file extension. So, and then I will hit save, and then uh, nothing happened, of course, because uh, my file, uh, the JPEG, is still in this um, document. But if I go to the catalog and I hit F5, refresh. Um, I think it's, oh yeah, there it is. I will have now my uh, georeference topography.tiff. And if I insert this into the map, I will have it exactly where it should be. So I could now remove this file. And just to demonstrate the principle, if I would now add the, uh, the original uh, topographical roster again, it will be uh, again at this... Uh, uh, the the origin of my coordinate reference system, um, but as you saw me just doing, if you add the uh, the new rectified topographical raster, it is at the uh, location where it should be. Okay, so now as the second part of the screencast, I want to demonstrate how we can uh, make use of uh, online available information. Um, either directly through the uh, ArcGIS program or uh, by going to data portals and downloading it yourself. And to start with, I will show what we can do from the inside of ArcGIS. And in order to do that, we can go to File, Add Data, and here we have uh, two functions, namely um, Add Base Map or um, Add Data from ArcGIS Online. Okay, so the difference between these two is that uh, <coughs> base maps are provided directly by ESRI as an online service, and the uh, ArcGIS Online is a specific environment in which you can also collaborate on data and share data, and has a huge uh, resource of maps <coughs> that you can also access on just a different um, uh, platform. So if we add base map data, we see that we have here a couple of, uh, well, indeed, basic maps. Uh, with, uh, for example, topography, imagery, ocean uh, bathymetry, open street map or terrain. And just to demonstrate the principle, open the imagery base map. Now, this will take some time because uh, it downloads directly from the internet a huge file. Um, and now we downloaded it and we can see that we have this, uh, this file that will... Um, dynamically a real-time download the necessary data from uh, the internet to be able to display the uh, um, the information um, relating to your current extent 
and that gets progressively um, uh, heavy of course so already we are waiting quite a bit to have the uh, the imagery um, rendered onto our map canvas and uh, <coughs> and maybe this is evident but just to point out um, this added a an element a new layer to our table of contents in which we can also uh, turn turn off and on some some items like uh, higher and lower uh, resolution images so this is a way to get very quickly base map data into our uh, into our map i will go back to our uh, research area um, and then i will show and now i will show how we can use arcgis um, data from the uh, arcgis online environment now what if we click on that what we are getting into is we are uh, have here an online search tool and uh, well a very useful source for uh, looking for uh, useful data at least in the context of the netherlands is uh, looking for paydoc files uh, paydoc is uh, a central public dienstverlening of the card so public uh, services on uh, on maps and this is actually uh, a collection of uh, government bodies um, that uh, offer uh, their uh, spatial information that they collect on uh, the population, the landscape and infrastructure in the Netherlands and they share it through the PDOC inter um, uh, infrastructure uh, for use. Uh, you can download them online, but you can also directly access them through ArcGIS online. So we will, uh, I will now hit uh, enter PDOC, hit search and then we'll see that we will get an, uh, a considerable number of, uh, of map layers that we can download. And as you can see, this is really considerable. Um, there are 422 uh, maps that we can uh, get access. So we have uh, the AHN data, we have uh, the Central Bureau of Statistics information uh, we have buildings, we have wind speeds at 100 meters high. Well, it is quite extensive what you can. Uh, the, there are here um, uh, the, the spread of um, different types of birds and so on and so forth. Um, so, yeah, this is all being offered through, uh, through PayDoc. And uh, let's, um, as a, uh, an example, add the age and data from this area onto our map. Let's take a look where it is. Um, did I just miss it? Oh, here it is. So here we have PayDoc, Actuel Hoogtebestand Nederland, so it's AHN. It's basically LiDAR, LiDAR data. And we uh, this is the, the third uh, edition of that, uh, which says something about the resolution of the measurements. And if I then click on uh, Add, it will uh, start adding this, uh, this data to our map as a layer as well. Okay, so we have now here the uh, AHN information, and there we have it. So this is the AHN information as it is downloaded directly from, um, from the server. Now, as you can see, um, we are not allowed to do much with this data. So we can use this as a reference um, and for visualization purposes, but it is not the same thing as downloading the actual raster file uh, such as we have it in the AHN um, uh, file that we already have been uh, working with. Um, but it is useful to uh, for this general visualization purposes. Okay, so it goes without saying that uh, you can use this uh, add data from RGS online also to uh, discover uh, the existence of data related to your own specific research area. I, sh I showed how to get data for uh, the context of the Netherlands, but of course there is uh, a multitude of, uh, of data files to get for your specific uh, research area. I just typed in Greece and I, uh, I get 604 uh, different options. Uh, so yeah, you can use this uh, to your advantage uh, on, on any area of the world you are working in. Now, uh, what I want to uh, show next is how you can go to online data portals um, where you can get these 
files individually. So I, I let's say I do not want to uh, access them through RGS. I just want to uh, freely browse the web and see if I can find any files or services that I want to, uh, 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 let's say, manually get into my GIS. Now, in order to do this, I will go to uh, open a browser. Now, let's say um, I will. I, I'm still interested in getting this uh, AHN data from an online source. So let's uh, <coughs> go for uh, AHN download. Um, then I will have here the pdoc.nl online uh, website, uh, which is the actual uh, website. Oh, let's go to the new one website where you can get this data as well and, and, and find descriptions of these datas and these data and and surely uh, many uh, governments from many countries have similar platforms where you can get uh, a freely uh, available data and um, if i want i can now uh, go and search for data sets now i can look for them but uh, conveniently enough um, the data set we're looking for is uh, in the uh, first uh, um, the first options here on the side. So I have here Actual Hoogtebestand Nederland, so it's AHN3, the one we were already working with. Let's look at the details. Here you we, you see a snapshot of the, the total data that has been collected. Um, and then here uh, down this page we can see two ways of accessing the data. Now in one way to go about it is to uh, to get a geo service uh, which is kind of similar to what you you saw me doing um, uh, when i accessed the arcgis online data so the the let's say the the technical uh, data transfer methods is, is similar uh, the source is of course different and here we can just directly download the data so just um, as a demonstration i will now get the uh, hn3 web mapping service um, and if i want to uh, use this what is important is this url and i can use this url to access this data uh, directly in rgs um, so let's uh, copy the uh, url and get back to rgs okay in rgs we can open the catalog and the catalog um, not only allows us to browse the data uh, on our hard disks, but also allows uh, making connections with these online services. So if I would, for example, um, now look for a JS servers, I can here add different types of uh, of uh, data sources. So there are some RGS specific uh, servers that we could uh, set up and then um, then get data from. But what I want to uh, do now is to add the uh, web mapping service server. So if I double click on this, I can add a URL. So let's paste the URL we just copied. I want the default version. I want to get the layers. And here we see the actually the similar layers as we were able to retrieve through the uh, PayDoc um, uh, entries into the uh, RGS online environment. And I don't think we need an account. So let's hit OK. Okay, so and there it appeared. So the uh, now we have here in our JS service this specific server, and now we can just add these data sources to our map. So if we would again go for the H and three five meter digital terrain model, we can um, drag and drop it into our map, and now we have it. So in case you, I mean, this is data that we already found through the ArcGIS online. Um, environment but if you would have um, a web portal that only allows you to access these uh, web mapping service urls you now now know how you can get them into your gis okay so again as i said earlier this has limited functionality so if we want to have the full functionality of working with raster data we actually want to download the files so let's go and do that So let's get back. Um, I will go back and we'll go to the download page for the HN3. Um, 
Yeah, so we click on the download sign. Um, what's now important is that we select the right sheet. So downloading all this data can take a long time because every single sheet is about uh, 500 uh, megabyte. So you can imagine if you see that all these little squares are th their own sheets. This is going to take quite some time to download everything. So um, it is indeed wise to uh, try and select the uh, data sheet uh, if you know what the one is that you need. Now, I know that this is the one that we are actually looking for. So we need this sheet that I now selected over here and the research area is over here. Um, and then we see here, this is in the sheet 40 CN2 and we can download different products now uh, for this uh, for this area. So in order to work with it, I would really like to have the best possible um, data. So I want the uh, 50 centimeter resolution uh, raster and I want the digital terrain model instead of the digital surface model. Um, and the digital terrain model is the surface model, but then filtered uh, so we do not have any buildings or trees uh, or other types of stuff that, that is not representing the actual uh, surface of the earth. Okay, so let's uh, hit downloads. Yes, that's fine. Okay, and this uh, can take some time. We are looking to 296. MB, so it's going to take a couple of uh, sensor uh, seconds to uh, to download, and will be given a warning when it's uh, when it's here. Okay, so and there we have it. So what we downloaded now is a .tiff file um, that is uh, un uh, when it's not compressed, it's 500 uh, MB and a little bit. Let's copy this into our data set that we are working with. and then it will turn up through our uh, our catalog in our uh, data set so we can add it to our map so just uh, do not forget to uh, hit f5 every now and then to see if it already um, is already available and there it is so here we have to download it uh, data sheet we can drag it into our map well i i addressed the issue of pyramids in the burst video and i want to create these pyramids so let's go for it we can see here the progress bar um, so it takes some time um, but here we are and there we have our data georeferenced and everything um, and yes so now we have the uh, the data to our um, available to us and now we have also full control over um, everything that we might want to do with it so there you have it okay and so with this um, demonstration of how to uh, get external data into our JS I want to head on to the final part of this uh, screencast in which I will be showing uh, how to create a new shapefile uh, how to uh, to open up the shape file for uh, digitization and how to uh, enter new data into that uh, that shape file okay so and what I want to be looking at is I want to see uh, to what degree the information of my georeferenced uh, raster uh, has some information that may be overlapping uh, with our archaeological excavation um, information uh, so I want to actually um, digitize the information on the georeferenced uh, topography. Now um, the uh, navigation now takes a lot of time because this base map is still here. So in order to uh, to uh, avoid uh, delays, I will just remove this. So we are only working with local files again. Okay, so. Um, this information, um, I want to see to what degree, um, for example, the, uh, the water filled ditch that we excavated in these trial trenches and that we may see a reflection of in the digital elevation model is actually overlapping with, for example, these, this, this street. Um, and yeah, so I will, I will digitize uh, this street amongst uh, some other things as an example. 
Okay, so to in order to create a new shape file, I will go to the catalog. I can uh, right click on our uh, connected folder, and then I can select new from the context menu, and then I can see a whole range of different items that I can now make. But I want to uh, have a new shape file, so I select shape file. I'll give it an appropriate name, uh, and then I can select the feature type. Now we have point, poly, polyline, and polygon. You know this by now. Um, uh, we have also multi-point and multi-patch. This is a bit outside of the scope of this introduction. Um, and it is important to know that you cannot have uh, more than one of these geometry types in a single shape file. So I will select polygon because I want to digitize polygons. And another thing which is very familiar by now is we have to set the coordinate system. So let's look for the right coordinate system. And we know what to look for. This is the EPSG, an index number of the RD new system that we need. So we select that and hit OK. And this is it. So we, we are happy with, with what it is now and we just hit OK. Right, so now we see that to our data set on our, in our, on our hard disk, and we can verify this, of course, by looking at the data set. And we see here that indeed a digitized um, shapefile has been created. Uh, and now we can also drag and drop this onto our, oh, it's already added, by the way. We already have this automatically added in our table of contents. So we can now directly start working with this. Okay, now in order to uh, to get on with the digitization of uh, polygons into the shape file, just uh, showing that we have an attribute table, of course, which has been created, but this attribute table is empty and has only uh, the default fields because, of course, um, we haven't uh, defined any uh, further columns uh, in which you would like to store data yet. So this is an empty shape file. And in order to start working with it, we have to start an editing session. Now, first of all, uh, let's switch on the editor toolbar like this. I will uh, edit and I will place it here in between the uh, basic toolbar and the georeferencer because I want to like uh, have this a bit central. And using this toolbar, I can start an editing session. Now, um, the editing session uh, opens up here the uh, panel that says create feature and uh, we can here indicate that we want to digitize into our shapefile digitize and what we want to uh, construct our polygons and you can see here that there are a few different types of uh, shapes that you can create uh, which have some uh, some basic shapes that, that will be drawn but we just want to have a total free um, uh, approach to, uh, to to placing points and creating uh, a polygon through uh, digitizing these uh, these different points. So we select that, and then we are actually ready to go. Now, why do you need to enter an editor an, an editing session? Um, the editing session is uh, actually locking this file, so nobody else can uh, can now open it and start editing. Uh, let's say that this file would be on a central uh, disk somewhere and someone else has access to it. Uh, it it is now unavailable for somebody else to digitize information so it's a very basic mechanism to uh, to avoid uh, the, the corrupting of uh, of information in these files okay then let's start with the digitization uh, process so let's say i want to uh, digitize these uh, little houses over here I said the quality of this uh, topographical raster is not very high, so this will only be an approximation. But for the proving the uh, or demonstrating the functionality, this is fine. And uh, having uh, started this um, this editing uh, session, uh, my cursor changed, and it is now automatically set to uh, create new features um, uh, Function. So if I would now start clicking on my map, I would be in fact be uh, digitizing vertices uh, Which will then uh, be tied together through polylines uh, forming eventually uh, polygons So let's go about this house over here and um, draw it So I've now just been clicking with my left mouse button to digitize these points 
um, if I uh, open the context menu with the right mouse button, we can see that there are many options here. You can uh, set a direction, uh, you can set a deflection, length, change the length, you can uh, let uh, insert absolute or delta xy values, you can enter direction and length, set it to parallel, perpendicular. Well, there are many options um, when you are digitizing to control the location your next um, uh, vertex is going to be placed. And I won't go through all of it, uh, just know that you can uh, be very precise when it comes to angles and, and lengths, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Let's say, uh, but let's say I'm happy with the house such as it is right now. I can just go uh, and I could hit the function two button, or I can just click on finish sketch, and there it is. Now we have a digitized polygon. Um, yes, the digitized polygon is now also visible as a record in our attribute table. Actually, um, there's not much in this attribute table and we may want to uh, enter, for example, an ID of our own or maybe a description or, or what have you. Now, in order to do that, I probably want to do that um, in a new field, um, but the adding new field option is only available outside of an editing session. So if I want to do that, I have to stop the editing session. Um, you can do that by hitting the editor and then stop editing. I want to save my edits. I can then go into the attribute table. I can now select add field. I will um, make a text field, so not short integer, but text. And I'll say I want a length of 50 characters, which is a bit much, but okay. So I'm able to enter uh, what I just digitized. So now I created a field in the attribute table. And if I would now turn back to the digitization session, I can now also um, enter information here. So let's just say this is house number one. Um, and I just saved the edits. Okay, now I can do, in this editing session, I can, uh, using the editor toolbar, I can do uh, more things. Let's say I've uh, been, I want to replace this for some reason, I can very simply drag and drop it. Um, there are other things we could do, we could, for example, edit the vertices, so I could just select the vertex and drag it, and then the shape of the polygon obviously gets changed. Um, if I right click on an edge, so the, uh, the polyline connecting these two vertices is also called an, uh, an edge, I can uh, uh, insert a vertex and then I can uh, make a more complex shape if that would have been necessary and so on and so forth. Um, and if I would just click then uh, outside of the polygon, um, my changes will have been uh, uh, the, the, the polygon will have been adjusted. Now there are other, other um, uh, tools that can come in handy. So the reshape tool, let's say I, I missed the corner here and I want to cut a corner out of my polygon. I start my editing outside. So I set one point outside and then I will select that this is the corner that I needed to ha uh, have uh, cut out of my model. So then I just draw it, do finish sketch, and then my model is changed. Uh, my polygon is changed accordingly, and we can do that the other way around as well. If we start inside and we end inside, then we can uh, actually add a, a part to our polygon, as you can see here. Well, maybe uh, two final tools which can be useful is the cut polygon tool. So if I just want to split it in two, I can do it like this. So now I suddenly have two polygons that are that I can now manipulate separately. Um, and if you look in the attribute table, you can see that I have indeed now two polygons called house one. Um, and a final thing uh, that may be useful to show is how you can rotate. So the toolbar also allows you to to rotate um, your individual polygons. So this, this is all functionality that, that may come in very handy when you are digitizing polygons. And I will now produce a series of control Z's which are undo's to uh, get back to uh, where we were at the beginning of this digitization uh, uh, 
session because I want actually just want my house back on its original location. Okay, now just for the uh, the, the purpose of uh, uh, repeating the process and, and uh, showing the principle just once again because I was talking about digitizing um, the roads over here. Um, let's just uh, go on and uh, and make a new polygon and show that we can now just go on digitizing um, progressively and add all these new features to our uh, polygon shape file finish sketch and now we have another digitized uh, shape file and this we could call road or what have you yeah so um so these are the basic uh, principles of digitization. There's one more thing I need to mention. Um, while digitizing, you've seen me, uh, well, not me, but you have seen this effect. So when I digitize and I come close, and this was already visible when I was doing the georeferencing, if I come close to uh, a specific uh, a vertex on the map, you see this little square appearing and what it does and now we see uh, the square actually pointing to an edge and what this is is this is the, the um, this is uh, the graphical um, uh, effect of the snapping option so snapping basically means that um, the uh, the area I'm going to select is magnetically so to say drawn to a point which is already in my uh, in my map canvas and this is very useful because if i would want to uh, digitize something that exactly follows the border of this polygon which can be of course very um, useful because usually these borders are discrete um, distinctions between either one thing or the other and so it makes only sense that these borders are exactly the same uh, so you can, but also with georeferencing, it makes sense if you have exact points to re georeference to that you also indeed select them correctly. And if you would just try to do that visually, there's because GIS has this uh, almost limitless uh, scale, it's always it's, it's almost impossible to exactly select a point with the exact same coordinates um, with with so many uh, numbers um, in decimals. So the, the snapping function is very uh, useful, and uh, um, and so it, this allows you to to very precisely digitize. Now the snapping options um, are important to understand how you can set them. So if I would have a snapping toolbar, uh, we have here the possibility to to select which which kind of snapping do we want. So this is just a matter of uh, of hovering over the option and reading so we have point snapping so it just um, uh, snaps to individual points you have end snapping you have vertex snapping so this is what what happens here is vertex snapping and then you have edge snapping so now it also snaps to the exact uh, edge of this uh, of this polygon and if we select uh, the options the, the little menu here we can um, we can turn snapping on and off and we can also do some more advanced snapping things like uh, the intersection between two uh, two polylines well the most important actually is the uh, the options here in which we can set the tolerance and now you can imagine that uh, if you have a, a very big tolerance so i would uh, set this to uh, 100 pixels and this is uh, screen pixels um then this this point is going to well in this case um the, it, well let's let's say it like this it is it becomes very difficult to to set a point right next to the layer the, the polygon even if i wanted to because we set the tolerance to be so uh so big that everything within a hundred pixels surrounding this uh this the the uh, a potential uh object to snap to is selected so i'm um, this can be useful, but it can also be very annoying. So, let's say um, setting the uh, the tolerance to a, uh, a a workable level is very important. So it actually helps you and does not just uh, is not just an hindrance, and um, you want to turn it off. So that's basically the uh, 
the snapping and uh, yeah it's very uh, very useful help when uh, when digitizing okay and so with the demonstration of um, the snapping tools I've come to the end of this uh, second screencast on uh, in which I'm introducing uh, ArcGIS 10.7.1 um, we've been going through the process of georeferencing We've um, accessed external data through the interface for ArcGIS, but also by going uh, online, uh, getting data from map portals, and then adding it to our uh, GIS um, document. And finally, I've shown how we can go about editing, and I've showed you various uh, tools uh, when it comes to editing. So with this, I want to finish this uh, the screencast. Thanks for uh, for listen listening and uh, and watching.